computer. Okay, now now I'm recording. <laughs> so I'm still getting used to the technology, okay? Um, but now I'm recording this so that we'll post this to, your, to our blog. Um, so, so welcome for all you folks who are just joining us by recording. Um, okay, so, um, so, so I'd like to start off with a quick explanation of um, how we've handled stock requests in the past um, and how this might be changing uh, in the future. Um, so, so in general, I just want you guys to understand my thinking about how I run our company in general. Um, I, I have a, a lot of rules of thumb, uh, and some of them are somewhat counterintuitive, so I think they deserve some explanation. Um, first of all, even though most of our revenue comes directly from photographers and only indirectly from clients, um, most of our focus tends to be actually on meeting the needs of clients, because I feel like uh, if we're not being relevant to clients, uh, we're not going to do an, our photographers any good. Um, so, so sometimes I think our photographers feel like, uh, like we're not paying enough attention to them individually. Um, but, uh, but it, often that's because we're really focused on, on understanding who our clients are and, and what we can do to, to provide a really valuable service to them. Um, and then, and then that in ter turn is going to benefit our member photographers. Um, second, um, when it comes to our directory, um, where I tend to think about what's going to be good for the group of photographers. Um, uh, sometimes um, in contrast to any individual photographer. Um, and this comes up in a couple of, of areas. Um, first, first, we're picky about the photographers we add to our group. Um, and so there might be some photographers who we leave out because we feel like they're not strong enough or not appropriate enough um, for, for a wonderful machine. Um, and so, so we're, in all respects, with, with quality, uh, we're looking for to add photographers who are going to make our group stronger and appeal to clients more. Um, we also curate, in addition to, to for, for quality, we curate for locations and specialties. And for example, uh, you know, our office is in Narberth. But if a photographer is in, Ar uh, in Narberth, like Gene Smirnoff is in Abington, I want to list him in Abington. I don't want to list him in Philadelphia. Um, and this is disconcerting to a lot of photographers who might feel like they're, they're going to individually be better off if they're listed in the big city near them. Um, but we feel like for the sake of transparency, uh, clients really appreciate that specificity. Um, and so we prefer to list photographers in, in their actual location. So, so these are examples of where there are times when um, we are making choices about what's, what's going to benefit the entire ecosystem of Wonderful Machine um, more so than, uh, than an individual photographer. Uh, and and he, even, even there are times when we're thinking more about the client than the photographers. And so, so these are, are counterintuitive, but I feel like they support uh, the long-term sustainability of our, of our, of our organization. Um, and so, and in general, I'm, I'm looking out for the entire ecosystem, which includes photographers, clients, and our staff. Um, and ultimately, uh, I feel I feel like if it doesn't work for everyone, uh, it can't really work for anybody. Um, so, with it, with that in mind, uh, let's let's talk about stock requests. Uh, so, in the past, the way we've handled stock requests is that when uh, is that clients would send us a request. Uh, and we would simply pass that along to our member photographers, uh, and those photographers would respond directly to those clients. So, uh, so again, that sounds that sounds great on the surface. Um, uh, we uh, we have uh, you know phot our photographers have mostly appreciated that direct access that, that they have to clients, uh, and and many of our clients appreciate uh, the the content that they have. Uh, they likewise have access to. Um, however, just, in frequent, just as frequently we've had complaints um, from photographers, for example, that the quality uh, or the, um, the price of those stock requests tends to be quite low. Uh, and we also have had complaints from clients uh, who have expressed that they don't, especially commercial clients, that they don't want to interact with uh, a dozen photographers to make one stock sale. Um, so, so in response to that, to those complaints, of price and of uh, being in, in, inundated with emails, we've been experimenting with uh, what we're calling managed stock requests. Um, and, uh, and, and part of the dilemma there is that these, these managed stock requests where we are taking more of an active role uh, in these stock requests is that they're very labor intensive um, and costly. 
Um, so ultimately, we feel we need to either charge the client uh, a production fee to, to, to carry out these stock requests, or we need to charge uh, our photographer a commission uh, or some combination thereof. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, another negative side effect from our sort of traditional stock requests is that, um, uh, is that what often happens is when we send, send out a request, it's not uncommon uh, to have five or 10 um, submissions be, be, you know, be sufficient. You know, sometimes we don't get any uh, qu um, appropriate uh, results, but sometimes we get three, four, five, six appropriate results and if we're simply passing that along to the client, uh, we are basically creating a glut of content that allows the, photo the client to then negotiate uh, you know, among all these choices. And it's just uh, Economics 101 will tell you that if you've got a client who has five choices, um, that's gonna drive the price down. And the client, it makes it very easy for the client to, to say to Joe, hey, Sue said she'd give it to me for 500 bucks. Can you do it for 400? Um, and we've seen this happen. Um, and what I'd much, what I'd much rather do um, in those cases is have wonderful machine negotiating on behalf of the photographers. So not only can we put um, Craig's experience to work uh, asking for what we feel like is a fair market value for those pictures, but we're also going to be um, creating effectively a monopoly um, instead of having five uh, different people uh, to choose from. Uh, the client is going to be basically forced to negotiate with one person on behalf of those five, which I think is going to have a tendency to, to raise the, the value of those pictures. Um, so, uh, so, but, but before, before we take any questions, um, I just wanted to give Craig a chance to talk a little bit more about his role. Uh, Craig, can you take over? Yeah, of course. And it's, it's really good to see all of you. Um, hi from quarantining. Um, so to follow up on Bill's notes, um, just to, to give you some background. So I've been with Wonderful Machine for over nine years and I've seen kind of every iteration of the stock request process um, and of the company more or less. Um, I've also, as you know, consulted with uh, photographers and clients to negotiate uh, licensing fees and to produce shoots of all shapes and sizes. Um, so with that, I've sort of become an expert on licensing. Before Wonderful Machine, I was an ARC buyer at Bank of America, and we primarily handled stock. We actually had six ARC buyers handling nothing but stock requests um, for our creative team. Um, so at the time, it was every kind of you know, all the direct mail that you get from your bank that has pictures of happy interracial couples gardening while doing online banking, you know, we were sourcing that kind of content. Um, so I come from a stock photography background um, and I've been following what's been going on with the landscape of stock photography um, alongside of producing the shoots at, at Wonderful Machine. Um, generally, as you know from getting these emails, we kind of have two types of stock requests. Um, one is editorial, you know, magazines and newspapers looking for content. Typically, they're hyper uh, specific um, in terms of uh, subject matter or location. So we get a lot of requests from publications like Afar or Travel and Leisure or Condé Nast Traveler looking for uh, pictures of specific, a specific restaurant in Copenhagen. You know, it's it really specific. Sometimes they're a little bit broader. Sometimes it's um, subject based. So we got one recently looking for portraits of the musician Yo-Yo Ma. You know, so they're pretty specific. They tend to come with space rates that um, those clients tell us they have their budgets kind of established up front. They know what they want to pay. We do take the opportunity to try to negotiate those rates as, as high as we possibly can. And we connect those clients with photographers. Um, you know, Bill mentioned it, at some point we did switch it up a, a little bit and we were taking commissions of those um, editorial uh, requests. But, you know, we, we realized that when you guys get an email uh, for a potential stock sale of $200, you know, 50%, you know, that's already pretty low. So for us to take a cut on that is a challenging thing and we want to make it worth your time to submit the content. Um, so for editorial requests right now, we are still connecting you, the photographer, directly with the client. And those photo editors, I think, you know, are okay receiving that content directly from you. If there's a time that they want to pay us a research fee to step in, you know, we're of course going to offer that and, and do that for them. But for right now, those editorial requests are still going, you know, you guys are, are connecting directly. 
Um, the commercial stock requests, um, of course, on the other hand, you know, ones from ad agencies and for brands are a little bit different, and those are the ones that we are are managing. Um, a couple uh, just recent examples of that. Um, Target needed uh, a picture of a red barn to feature on all of their dairy packaging in their stores. Uh, we worked with Delta Airlines. They needed a video of different parts of Mumbai. Um, Chase Bank, they needed some happy lifestyle photos recently. Prudential Financial, they need pictures of first responders. Uh, Pico, which is an energy company in Philadelphia, they were looking for uh, Philadelphia police and firefighters um, in uniform. Um, you know, so these requests are all over the place and budgets are all over the place. Sometimes clients have a budget, sometimes they don't have a budget, and sometimes they have a budget, but it's unreasonable. So it's my job to, to jump in to figure out how we can find the content they're looking for and try to negotiate uh, appropriate rates for appropriate usage at the onset of that process. Um, something that's really challenging is that, you know, obviously the biggest competition in the stock photography world is Getty. Um, and if you're not already familiar with this, um, recently they have switched to only offering royalty-free photos to clients. So you can no longer buy rights managed content on Getty. Um, so our competition, you know, we get clients coming to us and they might expect to pay 300 bucks for a royalty-free picture. You know, we get, we get questions oftentimes of, you know, can you do royalty-free? And obviously for you guys submitting, a con submitting content, you know, royalty free is essentially rights managed but unlimited use forever, which is the most valuable thing possible. So it's hard for us to compete with you know, unlimited use for, in perpetuity for a large brand at $300 an image. So I have these conversations pretty frequently with ad agencies and brands to figure out what an appropriate budget is for an appropriate usage and let them know that they're gonna be finding content through us that's not available mostly on, on Getty and is through photographers archives and uh, maybe personal projects that they've done and we've helped clients find some pretty obscure photos and you know, we feel that that comes at a premium um, especially when it comes to you know our time to manage that process um, so for those uh, requests you know right now that our mo is to charge a 50 percent commission on whatever licensing fee we're able to negotiate and if the, if the stock sale moves forward um, like Bill said, we did toy with the idea of charging clients research fees before, and we had some that were willing to pay that, um, but it's a risky proposition. You know, one in that a lot of clients aren't willing to pay up front because they can go to Getty and see content just right there. And, you know, right now, um, something we might work on, but right now we don't have a, a stock photography website where a client can just see everything right away. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is if clients pay us a research fee, we are kind of at... Um, I think oh. Craig froze up. So, um, and some really obscure stuff, oh. but it puts the, the pressure on us. Um, Craig, the other, Craig, can, you just, uh, can you just dial back? Can you just rewind for 30 seconds? I think you froze up there. Sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay. So I was saying, um, clients tend to, uh, you know, previously we've charged clients research fees and there are some that have been willing to, to pay that but it's a risky proposition in that we're at the mercy of what we can find. And sometimes that's just based on what photographers are able to submit. So it's a hard thing that some clients have been able to, are willing to pay that, some haven't. So we've kind of decided recently that, you know, the 50% commission on licensing fees is kind of our MO, but you know, we wanna hear from you guys on your thoughts about that. Um, one, two other things, you know, come to mind in thinking about this that I'd love to talk with you guys about, um, one of which is releases. So whenever we need, we, we have a request for any kind of commercial content. Um, we need talent model releases, sometimes property releases, location releases. Um, I realize that poses a, a, a large challenge um, for appropriate content. And we know that there are times where we can try to get that release if a client picks a photo and it happens to be someone you can track it down. Um, but that's something that's hard for us to, to manage and we can talk more about that. Um, I guess one other opportunity for us right now, um, not just given the pandemic, but just in general, um, I mentioned, you know, Getty going royalty free. Uh, I think that gives us the opportunity to license exclusive content to clients. So if everything on Getty is royalty free, I'm not sure how they're handling requests from brands that want exclusivity. They may still be negotiating different rates for clients to get that exclusivity, but that's something that they can definitely pay for and negotiate through us. So that's an opportunity for us. 
Um, and lastly, you know, we're getting a lot of requests um, you know, to potentially have photographers shoot on spec, meaning um, you, know, you may get Getty's custom content briefs where they're looking for photographers to go out and shoot something and submit it for the opportunity to potentially license it. Um, I've always sort of kind of took issue with a lot of those in that they're looking for very specific high production value type content, um, which is always a challenge. Um, you know, it's one thing if, if, we, if they or you know, any client is asking a photographer to take a, a landscape photo or a skyline photo where it just requires you and your camera. But some of these requests seemingly require specific casting and talent and styling. And you know, that's something that just has a high production value um, that photographers might not, or I would, wouldn't expect you to be able to shoot on spec without spending a substantial amount of money or just having the right connections of people who are willing to work for free. So that's um, something that we, you know, are cognizant of, um, but we are talk talking to more and more clients about the, the, the prospect of having photographers shoot on spec um, for projects that have an appropriate level of production. And right now, I think that means being able to shoot at home with friends and family and whatever you have. And there are certainly uh, clients that are willing to send product to different photographers to shoot in and around your house. So there are opportunities that exist. Um, I can share you know, some more uh, feedback I've had from clients, but um, that's kind of you know my take on it and where we're coming from. But you know, I think the point of this, we'd really love to hear from you guys, um, hear what kind of questions you have, what kind of um, feedback you might have on our current process so we can uh, take it from there. Yeah, if I can just jump in briefly uh, before we get to that, um, uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to echo Craig's sentiment that, uh, or maybe carry it one step further, this idea that, you know, Wonderful Machine has 550 photographers and we sort of have an opportunity to have, uh, to sort of create something with some force to it. Um, so, uh, you know, we certainly have ideas of our own, but, but we really would welcome your, your feedback as well, uh, so that we can together, uh, put something together that, that can really be meaningful and really help all of us. Um, uh, secondly, just very briefly, I, I introduced Gemma and Nadia, but just to expand on their role, um, Gemma and Nadia sort of tag team our approach of, of responding to the stock requests as they come in from clients, um, and send them out to our photographers. Uh, so, so those are the people you would mostly mostly be interacting with, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and then and then Craig sort of oversees that process. Um, one quick thought about image brief that um, Craig sort of alluded to. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there was a company that was in existence for a couple of years called Image Brief, where where they did sort of uh, on-demand stock, uh, basically, and and it is somewhat controversial. You know what we what we do, what we don't want to do at Wonderful Machine. I mean, I don't. I, what I don't think most photographers want is to create a situation where clients can just sort of arbitrarily say, Oh, the, here's, here's the assignment I want you to shoot, but I don't want to, I don't want to pay you an assignment fee. I want you to just do it on your own. So, so I'm not suggesting that we sort of create a situation where uh, it's, it's making things worse for photographers. I think, you know, with, with our 550 photographers, we have an opportunity to make things better. Um, so, uh, so I've posted a couple of questions in the com in the notes in the comments uh, in the chat there that you can click on and see. Um, if you if you want to jump in, you can either raise your hand or you can just yell out. Or yeah, we don't have that many people. We can just sort of like uh, run with this. Uh, or there's a raise hand uh, icon that you can also uh, utilize. Um, so 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 starting at the top and in no particular order. Um, does anybody want to jump in in general? Like, what would you want from our stock request process? I have a quick question. What's up, guys? Hey, Clay. Hey, uh, on average, how many, uh, what's up, Craig? Uh, like, when you send out a stock request, uh, I, I know it's dependent <laughs> on what it is, the, the content request itself, but on average, how many photographers submit to that? Or how much response so, are these are these clients getting? Yeah, so it really varies. I mean, so first with all the requests, we send them, of course, to all of our members. Um, and it really depends on how specific the request is. You know, like I said, sometimes if Travel and Leisure Magazine is looking for a specific restaurant in Tokyo, you know, there may be, we might get a couple of photographers who have happened to travel there and maybe a couple of photographers who live there. They're like, hey, I'll go shoot that this afternoon if it makes sense. Um, for the Chase Bank, 
uh, one that we sent out recently, it was more or less like happy lifestyle shots. We got a couple thousand submissions. Um, so it tends to be somewhere in between. Obviously, the more the broader the request, um, the more content we're going to receive, um, and the the more uh, the opposite is true as well. So potentially, these people are getting like thousands and thousands of photos in their Dropbox, right? Depending on so if it's an editorial request. Um, so what what we do is you know the editorial request. Obviously, we're connecting you directly with the client, and you're submitting to them, and you know they may be getting a ton of emails. Um, but with us, we take all of the content. We do one batch of curation as well. So we'll take a look at it. And there are some photographers that don't read the brief and submit content that isn't appropriate. Um, so we take it upon ourselves to at least take a, a look through everything and try to get rid of the shots that don't make any sense. Um, but yeah, and potentially, you know, we've had, you know, thousands of images, we've had hundreds of images or less. And it really just depends on the, I guess, the exact request. Cool. Thanks. All right, somebody. Okay, I have a question. Hi, Craig. Great. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, Bill. Hey, Rebecca. Um, so I noticed that on the commercial requests, um, you don't say who the company is specifically, like you just say healthcare company, financial company. And I'm curious if there's a reason why you do that. That's a really good question. So we've had a couple instances recently where Somehow, um, you know, we put out a request and the client <laughs> is able to go around us and get to the photographer directly or vice versa. And that creates the dynamic that Bill described earlier, where, you know, if, if we can be a voice for all of our photographers, we can get the highest rates possible. Um, so, you know, I can understand how it, it comes off maybe uh oddly on, on your end to not know who the client is um but we feel that you know not that we're trying to hide anything but we've found instances in which photographers were going around us and ad agencies and brands were going around us to connect directly and therefore driving the price down and really confusing the matter um and then obviously if a photographer negotiates a lower rate than we do we're then negotiating with that client and saying, oh, well, you know, here's a photo, you know, this would be, you know, $2,000. And they'd say, oh, I actually already heard from Joe and he said he'd give it to me for $300. So why aren't these, all these pictures, $300? You know, that's the kind of, we've had these situations come up before. So that's why we, uh, why we do that. Hmm. Okay. I wonder if there would be like a way you know, because I don't know, I'm sure a lot of other photographers maybe feel this way. But for me personally, like, there's some companies that I don't want to support and I don't want, you know, my images to go to. And so, you know, if it says maybe like oil and gas company, obviously, I might not submit, you know, but also like certain financial companies I might not submit to. So I wonder if there's like a way we could, I don't know, get around that somehow. <laughs> it's a really good point. And we have had instances in the past where we've put out stock requests. Um, you know, there, there could be political reasons why a photographer might not want to submit. Um, you know, there are projects for, you know, sometimes I get, we get reached out to by like tobacco companies or, you know, or the, I, the I totally, brothers once yeah, the Coke the brothers, we had one. Yeah. We had a, one for the Coke brothers a while ago and we had photographers not want to submit. So we totally get that. Um, I think everyone has a different, level of I think obviously it makes sense when it's a tobacco company or a very very political uh, type of company it's, an, it's a harder thing if it's just a, a, a bank you know um, to, to figure out who might either take offense or not want to um, submit um, but that is something that we can continue to think of um, think about and you know we're we're all open to ideas on how we might maybe be more transparent or if it is somewhat perhaps controversial in some way, you know, maybe we'll be more specific, I suppose, on, on who that company is. Yeah, and cer certainly on those, if we say this is a, um, a tobacco company, uh, that would be an easy for one for you to sort of decide to be involved in or not. Um, if, it's, if it's like a financial institution and you're not sure, you know, you can feel free to email Nadia or Gemma or Craig and, 
and say, hey, can you give me more specific details? I mean, if it's, um, you know, we, we want to we want to we want to facilitate this for you. Um, and so we're happy to provide that information when when necessary. OK, thanks. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so when they come to you with the stock requests, are they also looking at like Getty and other sources and comparing or do they come to you for a certain reason? Yeah, interestingly, sometimes clients come to us after they've exhausted Getty and they say flat out, look, we've, we've tried Getty. They just don't have what we're looking for. We're looking for something that's deep in a you know, photographer's archives or from a personal project, um, or we need to make sure this photo is taken by this kind of photographer in this part of the country. So sometimes right away, we know that they've already looked on Getty. Other times it's clear that they are trying to reach out to just every possible resource they have, including us, including Getty. There are still a couple you know, independent stock agencies out there. Um, and it's kind of a, a mix and, you know, it makes it a challenge, you know, budget wise sometimes for us to try to compete with Getty, but we try to just convince clients that, you know, what they're getting from our photographers, um, they're not going to be able to get the $300 for the same usage. Um, but what we can give them is, you know, really unique content, um, and really hyper specific content, um, as long as we're able to negotiate appropriate fees for appropriate usage. And, and what do you guys think about shooting on spec? Um, do you, um, is that something we should be encouraging with clients or, or discourage? And I can give an example of that. Um, so, you know, recently we've been, uh, we've been talking with Kohler, you know, they make faucets, uh, bathtubs, you know, toilets at that company. Um, and it was kind of as a result of this creative in place project that we've been, uh, sending out to you guys you know we're telling all these brands that we have you know five six hundred photographers at home right now and for a brand like that that makes home uh not appliances but things that go in your home um it seems like a natural thing to potentially have photographers shoot that kind of product whether that company sends you a new faucet to install or if you happen to have that kind of uh, product in your house so you know in that is an example of, you know, if they were to come to us and say, hey, you know, can you put out a brief to your photographers and maybe we'd be interested in using this content on our social media and we're willing to pay $500 an image or whatever it is that I, we can negotiate. If we put that out to you, you know, previously, you know, it may not have been something that we would have done, but, you know, in thinking about all of the photographers at home right now, um, is that something that would offend you? Is it something you'd be, you'd be down with? Is it something that um, you'd be down with regardless of the pandemic? Um, so that's, the, that's just one example of a company that we're, we're talking to. But you know, there are lots of other similar brands that we're going to be pitching this sort of thing to. Um, so just kind of curious um, what your thoughts are on that. What if it's more than 500 bucks? <laughs> I I have something to say about that. I, you know, because we're all at home right now with all this time on our hands, it obviously seems a little bit more doable. But typically, um, it seems like such a shot in the dark to me um, that my I, when I hear about, you know, offers of spec, I often just have way too much on my to-do list already. Um, so that's kind of how I felt about those in the past. I was, I don't remember the specifics of image brief. Um, I think you just got on an email list and, and then they would send um, things to you. I was on their email list and I remember, um, I feel like with them specifically, there might've been a couple spec things that I tried for the first time. And then in the end, when it didn't get picked, just kind of felt like that felt like a little bit of a waste of time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to provide more context, I mean, sometimes we put out stock requests um, and photographers take it upon themselves to go shoot. Like I said, you know, if a client's looking for a, 
a landscape or something and you happen to have it in your backyard and you happen to not be doing anything that day, sure, that makes sense for you to pick up your camera and go do it. But sometimes we've seen requests um, where it's, you know, a client wants a picture of a very specific looking person wearing a specific outfit, doing a specific thing, holding a specific product. You know, that requires some coordination and that requires a lot of time and energy. And we, we need to find the right balance between budget and production level to feel comfortable sending it out to you guys. Um, whereas, you know, it, we want to make it so if, you, if it doesn't get picked, you don't feel like you've spent $5,000 worth of energy, you know, creating a, a photo that, that wasn't selected. But, you know, we, we definitely, you understand right now, it's different in that you're a lot of projects halted um, and you are at home. But we want to make something, we want to go about this in a way that lasts through the pandemic. Um, that's something that you guys are going to be comfortable with when this is all over as well. But um, I, do, I do hear that. Um, I, I hear what you're saying there. And, and to answer the, the question, um, with spec work, would the company be obligated to select from the options produced? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, certainly you could negotiate anything you want. Um, but, uh, but as I recall with Im Image Brief, um, it's been a couple of years, but I don't, I don't think that was part of their deal. I think that, that the company would, um, uh, the, the image brief would send out the, the, the creative brief to their, their photographers and, uh, and the company would have the option of, of turning it down. They might, uh, at that time, they might've paid a, a production fee just to initiate the process. Uh, but I don't think that they were obligated to license the material. We've also toyed with the idea, we, it's not come to fruition, but you know, the, the idea of getting clients to pay some sort of very nominal shoot fee um, to get photographers kind of interested and to cover some time, um, maybe whether it's you know, 500 bucks, something like that, to select a handful of photographers. So the client pays a very small amount of money. They don't get any licensing or usage out of that, but it does cover some photographers' time to create the work. Um, like I said, we've not moved forward on that thing, but it's something that we have talked to a few brands about. Um, again, it's, it's a challenging thing in that the idea for brands to pay money and not necessarily get usage to something isn't always appealing, but you know, there, there may be some kind of in-between where we're able to cover your time, but the client doesn't necessarily get usage uh, until they select something and then it, we take it a step further. Um, but again, you know, the, the competition is, you know, a Getty, which basically has, you know, all of this content readily just sitting with the photographer that clients can see and potentially license immediately. So, you know, there may be some in-betweens, um, but it sounds like, you know, a lot of brands are interested. I mean, if I were a brand, you know, I'd love to just say, hey, who, who can shoot this thing? Like, show me what you got and maybe I'll license it. Like, I get, I get it from their perspective. It's a hard sell obviously on, on our end and on, on your end, if it requires more than a couple hours of your time and a lot of effort. Uh, so you know, we, we kind of understand both ends of it and we're trying to figure out a way to, you know, we're sitting on you know, the network of photographers, you guys, and we have all these clients, you know, we, there's gotta be something that we can do um, to, to meet those needs with you guys, perhaps being able to, or willing to shoot things on spec but we're, you know, it's why we're here. We want to hear from you on what, what your comfort level is with that sort of thing. Um, I just have a comment about, yeah. so if, if these brands get photographers to shoot on spec, and I'm thinking of like these competitions that you had with like eating in place and stuff and how creative people have been. Um, so if there's nothing to stop a company from like not hiring a photographer through you, like they could just take the creative that they see and go on with that with another photographer or whatever, right? Like, I feel like there should be some sort of protection about the creative licensing. Sorry, are you, are you talking about the, the Creative in Place project or would you mind just clarifying well, your question? Uh, so if we shoot on spec, then we, and we're kind of like interpreting what they want and there's no specifics really, then we're kind of using our creative um, vision on it. And so it's like we're giving them like options of creativity. Sure, yeah, I mean, that is a, a risk. So you're basically, you're 
your concern is that, you know, a client gives a very loose brief and you give them something that is like a, somewhat of a new idea or, you know, creatively taken to a next level. And they could take that idea and say, this is perfect. Let's get this other photographer to do it, to right. execute this a step further. I, I get that. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, in terms of like infringing on your, uh, cre it wouldn't be copyright like infringement, copyright. obviously, you know, yeah, you know, it's sort of, I, I get where you're going with that. Um, that's a, a challenging thing for us to figure out a way to, to block a client from being able to do. Uh, but I, I see the concern there for sure. Well, I'm, um, I'm just saying if they're not committed to licensing anything from, from the group, then mm -hmm. maybe there should be some sort of commitment they have to like. Per yeah, that might be a tough yeah. sell. Yeah. Um, and uh, Rebecca, can I ask you a little bit about your experience with Offset? Yeah. So, um, so can you share with us, like, uh, how long have you been working with them and approximately how many pictures do you have in their collection? Yeah, um, so I've been working with Offset for a while. I don't remember exactly when they started, but I feel like I was um, with them pretty early on um, from their beginnings. Um, and I sort of just use it as like a place to put images that, you know, normally would be just sitting on hard drives. Um, I probably have like only a hundred or so images. So it's actually been my goal during this time to send them another big batch of images because it's been kind of a couple years since I've updated it. Um, and is it all royalty free or, or do they, do they offer rights managed? They do, I think, but I'm not familiar with that aspect of it. I think most of it is royalty free, um, but they've started doing, I think, like offset exclusive. So maybe that is um, rights managed. I'm not sure. I haven't really looked into that. And do you know what, do you recall offhand what your share is on a sale? Hmm. Not offhand, but I can, I can email that to you. I can okay. figure it out and let you know. Okay. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, one uh, one other option that, that I've been thinking about is should Wonderful Machine uh, be creating a, a stock picture library? We frequently have clients ask us this, and we frequently have photographers ask us this. Um, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this for 13 years, um, uh, ever since I started Wonderful Machine, but I, but I realize uh, what a massive undertaking it is. Um, uh, Cameron Sterling has joined us and, and he might be able to speak to this a little bit. Uh, Cameron uh, spent a couple of years working for Adobe Stock uh, when they started up, when they first started up. Um, but, I, but I recognize what a big job it is. Um, and, and it is, uh, but, but I think the fact that Getty Images has gotten out of rights managed stock photography could potentially be an opportunity for us because, because I can understand why it wouldn't be profitable for Getty because they're such a massive uh, corporation and and how rights managed is such a tiny part of their revenue stream um, uh, but for a company that's small like wonderful machine uh, it, there might be enough uh, revenue there for us to capture there might be enough demand even though it's small there might be enough small demand in the industry uh, to justify uh, building a company around rights managed stock photography um, if we had the right buy-in from photographers um, and, and one of the, one of the challenges I've seen over the years is, is the consolidation of the stock picture industry where, uh, most of the, uh, the dirt, I think the dirty little secret in stock photos is that you create a stock picture agency in order to sell it to Getty or, or one of the other big stock picture agencies. And, and the stock picture agencies start out saying how they're an advocate for photographers and you're going to get this big share and, um, and then over time, uh, the share, uh, the, the splits uh, drop um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the companies end up selling to a bigger company. Uh, and, then, and then you're sort of right back where you started. Um, and and so, so there's been, you know, ever since um, Masterfile and ever since digital photography, we've seen sort of photographers losing leverage in this situation. Um, and the only way I can see to get it back would be uh, to create a photographer-owned stock picture agency, uh, where if you could get, 
you know, a couple thousand photographers together who were high quality photographers. And if you could get them to um, want to be part of a rights managed photog uh, stock photography business. And if you, if you could get them to, to um, provide exclusive content that, that those clients couldn't get any place else so that they couldn't under, undercut those fees. Um, and if it was owned by the photographers, if it was a cooperative, there'd be no reason to sell to some other company. Um, so, um, so is that, has anybody else thought of this? Am I crazy or is this, is this potentially a viable solution to capture that, uh, that revenue? Are you guys feeling like you'd rather have, uh, you know, a lower volume of sales at a much higher price point, uh, or, or are you just, are you happy with the current sort of stock photography business model? Cameron, hi. Hi, there, can you hear me? Oh yeah, now we can. Okay, I just want to chime in a little bit. Um, hi everyone, I, I worked at Adobe, uh, helped them start their premium stock in 15, 16, 20, 15, 16, 17. Um, my experience with the stock is there's, think of it as like a product and you have the sort of high efficiency, easy to get type of product where you go and you search. Uh, the search is really fast keyworded or you can drag and drop images and find your image that you is like another image if you're an editor or a buyer. Um, and that makes their job really easy. So if you think of these companies as like having different products now, bigger companies like Adobe and Offset and Shutterstock and Getty, they also have more enterprise level business B2B too. So you have your average, um, average, your smaller shop people buying images, but then you also have businesses enterprise and they will have a service person or, or team who, whose job is to work with that account. Um, like they're maybe working with a Coca-Cola company or whoever they're working with. And so, they have the more of the high touch research services that they offer um, and the fees can that can be built into depending on if it's volume um, like they're what they would like the company needs 10 or 100 or 1000 images um, and you're going to guarantee you're going to find those images for them. Um, so I think if you're thinking of this, you, you want to think about what kind of product is this company going to be and then this also kind of translates to the brand of Wonderful Machines stock, like what kind of, how are people going to think about it? Um, I think the find what you're looking for, like tagline is of course very appropriate to stock here because you're helping the, the client find what they're looking for. It's just how are you helping them find what they're looking for? Is it through someone like Craig or someone who's going to help them do the research? Or is it because they ha you have a really great user interface and they can come and find what you're looking for? Um, personally, I, I think stock works really well when it's efficient for everyone. So if these are images that you've already made and they're just sitting in your hard drive and you have the rights to use them, or maybe you don't need the rights because they're a still life or something, um, then you can upload those and have them curated by someone in Wonderful Machine who can help you um, sort of select the best of the best because people who buy stock often want options. So if you're photographing um, a cup or a person or whatnot, you want to maybe have a horizontal or a vertical and slightly different angles, different kinds of negative space. So the, the buyer sometimes can, can choose how it might work in their layout. Um, and so I know when I worked with uh, Adobe, we would often select maybe 15 or 20 images of the same shoot out of 100 to get the kind of the, the best of the best to give the client some options too, um, depending on how they might want to use the image. Um, royalty free is obviously very easy. Um, Adobe, I think, was offering around 35 to 40 percent of the sale, and the price points of the images there, and they're probably about the same now, range between 10, 50, 70, 250, 500 at the most. And we definitely saw very few sales around the $500 mark. So clients weren't really willing to pay that much at the time. I don't think it's changed too much. And that means that you were probably getting 220 um, for that particular image. Um, now, so, and then to some degree, the price point was up to the 
contributor, and then the, the price could probably be between 250 or 100 um, if your idea was to make more sales. Um, so those are just some thoughts to think about when you're thinking about selling stock as a brand and the different kind of service services you're going to have, whether it's more labor intensive and you're selling that as a service to research or if they can come in and really easily see it. I mean, I do, I do think having a gallery of at least teaser images would be helpful to like try to sell it. Um, so there's at least some sense of like what's it available, um, whether or not those actual images are available or not. Um, I know, I don't know if you know Heather Elder, but she's recently started to incorporate stock on her website from her people who she reps. So that could be an interesting kind of model to look at to see how she's handling both showing it and um, the brand of it too. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other thing. There, there's a guy named uh, Jim Pickrell and he has a website called Selling Stock. And I think it's just selling-stock.com. And it's a really great website for learning all about like the stock business industry um, in terms of trends, big companies, mergers, what's happening, video, motion. Um, there's a whole lot going on in the stock world and selling stock is a good resource for learning about what's happening there. You mentioned two things that I wanted to follow up on. Um, I had mentioned that I was an art buyer at Bank of America and you're right, Cameron, you know, we had a, a rep at Getty um, who, you know, I could go on Getty and search for happy couple gardening, but, you know, I, I would send it to her and say, hey, you please do this research for us and send us your results. And it was also considering the volume that we licensed for them. It was also kind of a name your price situation. So whatever, whether there was rights manager royalty free, we'd say, we like this picture. I know the, but I know your calculator says this should cost $300 or $3,000. We want to pay this, you know, so for every major enterprise level client that these massive stock agencies work with, you know, they're kind of naming their price or they're coming up with um, sort of a yearly fee to get unlimited amount of photos or a certain number of, of photos. So that definitely exists. And, but another point you mentioned was about how potentially labor intensive of requests could be or couldn't be. So if it is it totally self-serve or not. And a lot of what we get at Wonderful Machine isn't just, we need a picture of a dog, but it's the clients want to know more about the photographer themselves. So you guys probably all got an email this afternoon. Um, AARP is looking for photographers who are Gen X and who are single moms or dads. So it's not just about the content itself. They want more to know about the, the photographers. We had a request two weeks ago where a, a client wanted a photographer who happened to have kids who could shoot car seats and um, strollers. Um, we've had uh, clients that um, need photographers based on you know, gender or not just you know, geography. So a lot of times what we're doing are trying to identify photographers, not just on the content themselves, but to expand that and to know more about them and then try to expand the project a little bit. Um, so it is a pretty, a lot of these requests are labor intensive. Um, and when we put out a request, you know, when we put out, I mean, just as an example this afternoon, you know, when we ask, you know, who is a Gen X and a single parent, you know, I get responses where it's like, well, um, I can pretend to be a, a single parent if that's the idea. Like I look like I could be a single parent. Like I happen to be born in 19, you know. So for every type of request we put out like that, we get we get hundreds of photographers sometimes asking us questions like that. Um, or photographers, we put out stock requests and they respond and then they say, well, should I just go shoot this on spec? Do you have more creative direction? You know, so we're having conversations with so many photographers. It's not just self-serve. It's not just that we put out the request and we don't respond to any photographers. It's the opposite is true. It's very labor intensive, not just in terms of acquiring the content and organizing it and submitting it back to the client. It's we're having conversations and following up and, you know, do I need a model release? What's a model release? Do, you know, I shot this on a public uh, sidewalk. Do I need a permit? You know, we're having these conversations with all these photographers and that's what makes it labor intensive. So, um, you know, just to, to follow up on your point about the different kinds of stock agencies that can exist, you know, I'm sure Getty deals with a lot of that, but unlike them, you know, and the photographers that have worked for them to create content specifically for stock and maybe self-funded or they 
fund those stock photo shoots were coming about it at a different from a different perspective and um i think that's what also makes us unique in that they can't necessarily a client can't necessarily search getty to know which of the photographers submitted the content of the dog who happened to be gen x and single moms and can they also photograph that dog with themselves in it and this is for a story about single mom you know that's the kind of request that we get that we want to try to expand the creative scope and try to figure out how we can help clients to not just sell a stock image but to then maybe commission that photographer to do a little bit more and maybe turn it into a larger production even if the the budgets are still tight so that's the kind of stuff that we, you know, are always thinking about when we get these requests. One other thing I just want to add to, it hasn't been mentioned yet, is legal. And it's also a big consideration is um, in the image, apart from the model releases, is property releases and location and art releases. And there's a whole legal you know, document that we were working with at Adobe that cut out lots of images that were great images that couldn't be used because they couldn't be royalty free because of the car or the license plate or the building or what have you. So in terms of creating contributors who are aware of what kind of content to submit, it's also legal, you know, guidelines are, are important too. Hey, Cameron, Cameron also um, in your experience with Adobe, um, can you give a sense of what proportion of the contributing photographers were sort of full-time legit professionals and what percentage were sort of part-time or hobbyist photographers? I think they were mostly professional photographers. There were very few people who were not, they were amateur type of track. Now, that is not to say, I think most of them, this wasn't their primary source of income. Well, that's and, what I'm asking. Like what, what yeah. proportion of the photographers are sort of primarily full-time professional photographers and what proportion are Obviously. something other than that? So like, yeah, so I would probably say none of them, this was their primary revenue stream. It was none either, no, I think it was either 50% or 40 or something, but. Oh, well, no, I, I, sorry. I, I don't mean to say uh, was stock photography their primary revenue. Um, I'm asking uh, what percentage of your contributors were full-time, so like supporting themselves full-time as commercial or ed editorial okay. photographers? I would say probably 80%. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's interesting. And then, uh, and then do you have a sense of uh, what the average photographer was making on, on their stock photography return on investment? Sure. And I, I didn't actually get to see a lot of the, the numbers that got like that kind of data. Um, but from the information that I heard about, knew about, I think it was between a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So, Some people, so maybe 10,000 10, might be a lot for a year. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, it, it's all about return on investment. Um, and so, so I, you know, as I was, I was a commercial photographer for 25 years. Um, and, and I can tell you that if, if I had, uh, an opportunity to make a hundred sales at, at 50 bucks each, uh, or two sales for $10,000 each, uh, you know, I'd rather do the two sales. Um, so, so is, is there, um, uh, is there a calculation? What, what's your gut feeling about the viability of, of, of rights managed stock photography? Uh, are photographers going to be better off um, or, or is it, uh, does the, I mean, my premise is that the volume game benefits the stock photo agencies, but it actually hurts the photographers. Um, is, do you believe that that's true or, um, or do you think that the volume, uh, work, the volume sort of business model works for professional photographers? Well, I think you can have both. I just think you have to have expectations about what the ROI is going to be and how much you're going to put into it as a photographer. Um, I think for still life photographers and landscape and environmental, I think sometimes the cost is lower to produce. Of course, now you can't do models and such, but um, people do do model shoots for stock um, and they do libraries of that stuff. Um, so I think a lot of it is just the expectations you have around your ROI. Um, I think if you think of it as like, okay, I'm gonna make an extra five or $10,000 this year, 
Um, great. Um, I think part of the appeal of stock too is it's sort of supposed to be passive. It's not supposed to be necessarily like spec or something where you're, you're I mean, I, I get I get that's a kind of a product of stock, but I think it, it works well for photographers once they've uploaded a thousand images. And then of those thousand, maybe 500 or 400 will get selected or even less because they don't always get every image and you shouldn't have expect to get every image online that you put on in there. Um, so, but then it becomes passive and then over the years you just get this revenue stream that comes in. Now, of course, there are trends that you want to think about and retrend trend reports and color reports and patterns and what's happening in, in the market um, for content to see what kind of content is relevant now. Um, lifestyle choices like work from home pictures, of course, you're seeing a lot of those. Um, Adobe just sent out a uh, a call. Uh, uh, it was posted on LinkedIn. I don't know if any of you saw it. Did you any of you guys um, see that on LinkedIn? No. Um, I happen to have it uh, right here, um, and I can share it with you, Bill, and you can send it on to people if you want to. Do you want to, do you want to share it in the in the chat? You can. Can you send a link in the chat? Uh, Yeah, I wonder if I can upload it to the chat. Is it is it something that uh, you would want to share a link or to actually share the visual? Uh, well, I just dropped it in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 loading in and everyone can download it. This was published by a guy who I used to work with on uh, at Adobe. And so it's it's not it's not like business proprietary or anything like that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have posted it there. Okay. Um, but again, so I, I, I guess I don't, I don't see it yet. Did it? Did you? Did you? Oh, it's, it's still loading up. It has uh, should be there. And oh, that's space. <laughs> um, okay. But again, it's sort of like the brand of Wonderful Machine. And what, how is it branded as a stock agency? And of course, I think if you think of it as like this not quite like even even more like special than Stocksy. Um, if any of you know Stocksy, um, if you think of it as like this or cabin where you have like this sort of it's like a boutique almost. And I do think like services and the uniqueness and the rarity of the content um, would be kind of part of the brand that, that is attached to wonderful machine stock. Um, so there it should be loaded there for people. Okay. All right. So we're we're at we're at five oh one. Um. Uh. One last question to just satisfy me. Uh. If we if Wonderful Machine were to create a sort of cooperative uh, stock photography, um, uh, business, uh, where where our contributors would, um, pay uh, a small monthly fee maybe 25 bucks a month to, to participate and then get dividends uh, instead of instead of uh, instead of working uh, with a private company uh, we would create a cooperative where the where the, the the membership fee would pay the overhead and then all of the profits would go back to the photographers is that something that any of you would be interested in one Okay. I mean, I think it kind of depends, but I would be interested. Um, I have um, a phone call that might be coming in, and if it does, I'm going to have to go just so you know. But um, real quick, uh, I have stock with a plain picture, um, which is more uh, like an exclusive commitment and a rights simplified model. They were rights managed. And then opposite end of the spectrum, Alamy, which I started with both of those when I was just very new to stock and just, I was like, let's see what happens. Um, I have had a lot more success with plain picture and the, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Cameron, you were saying that the, that kind of model really benefits the stock agency more than the photographer. And I would completely agree because even with all of the hundreds of images I have with them, my sales have been so low versus plain picture, which is much more selective. Um, but, and I've sold, I mean, I've sold more pictures, but then also the, 
the profits are, you know, they're selling them for more. So I'm making more with them. And it also just feels better. There's nothing like seeing your picture sell for $5 and just being like, ugh, that feels yucky. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and one, one, one last thought. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of breakage or Cameron, I forget whether you and I have talked about this, but, um, um, but, but one of the things about this trend in the last 20 years um, is in addition to sub-licensing where, where sometimes a stock picture might get licensed and then sub-licensed to multiple stock picture agencies. Um, also, the subscription model has eaten into photographers' profits quite a lot too. So has anybody heard of the term breakage besides Cameron? No? All right, so, so this was news to me. I just, I just sort of learned about this a couple of years ago, but um, with, with a subscription, if a client, let's say, is, is spending uh, $500 a month to have access to you know, 10 stock pictures at $50 each, they might, uh, they might only use part of their subscription. Uh, so so just, just like when you, you know, subscribe to Netflix, you might only watch one movie one month. Um, but, but you're still going to pay as a subscriber to that stock picture agency. You're going to still pay that whole fee every month. And uh, whether you use uh, whether you use all or or some or none of your actual downloads, um, on the photographer end, the photographer does get that thirty percent uh, or whatever their negotiated rate is um, for for each of those sales. But everything else that doesn't get sold is is referred to as breakage. And what that means is that is that the overall budgets for that go to stock photography from these big ad agencies and these big brands and the magazines, a lot of that never sees, you know, the photographer doesn't even get 30% of that, they get zero of that. And so, so there's been multiple uh, different um, ways that photographers have gotten a smaller and smaller share of the stock photography pie. Um, and so, so that's, that's what I'm uh, trying to, that's the puzzle I'm trying to solve is to, is to raise up that, um, uh, that, that piece of the pie. All right. So, so we've, 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 uh, we've, we've gone, come to the end of our hour. Does anybody have any other, uh, comments before, before I let, uh, everybody go? Okay. And, and I'm happy to stick around, um, until Adrian calls me for dinner. So, um, so I'm going to let Brian and Will and Nadia and Craig and Gemma go. And if any of anybody else wants to stick around and ask me more questions or or uh, complain in any way, uh, I'm all for it. All right. But thank you all for for joining us, and 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 I hope to see you again next Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. I'm going to sign off here too, Bill. Cameron, thanks for thanks for sticking around. I enjoyed uh, hearing from you, and uh, thanks thanks for your contributions. Yeah, if you have any other you know stock questions or such, um, let me know. I love the yeah. idea. I love the idea. <laughs> yeah, you're on you're on my short list of people to talk to about this. Um, I've I've got a, a number of photographers who've expressed interest in sort of creating some sort of collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, it's just uh, it's just a tr I think it's a tremendous undertaking. Um, even if, even if we had the investment money from photographers, it's, it's a big job to, to think about, but, uh, but I'll, but I'll, but I'll circle back with you when, when we get a little closer. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, take All right. Care. Take care. Okay. Bye. Hey, Bill. And Cherry, Cherry Lee, are, are you coming from, from Beijing? Oh, oh she's we just lost Cherry Lee. <laughs> hey, Gene, how are you? Good, good. Um, no, I, I, um, I wasn't sure I had an idea for this, for the, for this, um, what is it? Uh, the first thing we talked about, the spec. I thought maybe if it's, um, if we can, if there's a way to identify who's interested in that and then have those people, you know, participate in that program. And then basically a client might have to pick, you know, like five people that they like out of those people that are interested in participating in general in these things. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, maybe they do like, a, <laughs> My Lord. Um, My Lord, you are a maybe they do a very like simple brief proposal, like a text, proposal, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a write up proposal.
I'm sorry. Say that again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I think she. I think she turned it off. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So, so the client would pick, you know, a number of photographers that they're interested in. So it's probably yeah. like some kind of automated way, so they can they you know as the, have don't have to really manage it as much, you know. So they pick uh, certain photographers, like five to ten photographers, uh, and they get notification to make like a really simple proposal how they see this sort of spec assignment uh, how they see uh, accomplishing the assignment mm -hmm. and so they in the end uh award that photographer with a really small like budget just to just to, uh, just to cover their time you know and so the licensing is not guaranteed but but they get something so they don't feel like they're totally wasted their time um just for the time for, so they can they can produce something and they can still feel like you know their, their time wasn't abused uh, but then you know they can award it later if they want to you know so do you know what i mean yeah and and i want to say hello to nt is that you nt st Clair? are you are you with us <laughs> all right so um so i so uh, you know the the dilemma there gene is that um, you know, um, is that different than an assignment? Like what, um, I, 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 I'm not sure if that, how functional that would be. Um, so, you, so you can imagine a client, like under what circumstances would a client want to sort of propose that and go through the, uh, go through that process? Um, isn't it wouldn't it be better more functional to just simply assign you know like yeah, pick from uh, a, a group of photographers and so make an assignment uh, so they basically well like they I mean if they have a small hmm, it's yeah I mean it is it is tricky it's it's obviously nobody wants to work for free and also not be guaranteed in the end uh, but I'm just thinking, you know, if it's a hybrid, but then, yeah, it kind of takes away from the actual idea of assignment. Yeah. Um, which is, you know. Inti, hello. Hi. How, how are you? <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I was listening yeah. to the ASMP talk and because I haven't gotten any loan stuff. And so are we, are, there, are we really only the four people on this call? So, so, so the call was at from four to five and, and, and <laughs> this, 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 this is, this is who's left. I, I didn't realize ASMP had a call. I, I should have checked. Yeah. Um, they have been really, really helpful when it comes to any of the legal stuff. Um, P, you know, the PPP or the SBA or anything. They have a lawyer who gets on and he is like really up to date on everything. And like so far he's been, because I've been listening to all these different talks from where APA, wherever, and he has been by far the most useful, like the most functional and, and really like knowledgeable. So Yeah, I've, I've sat in on a couple of those uh, webinars and I, I agree, I, um, he's, he's a very smart guy. Uh, and and this one I, think, was, I mean, they are not done yet. It was like two hours and 15 minutes. Oh, in. really? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think he's a former photographer himself. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And, um, and were you able to, uh, did you apply for a PPP? PPP I did. Line? I applied for the EIDL and I applied for the PPP and I got neither. Oh, uh, I mean, I wasn't denied. I just haven't, you know, now the money's gone and it, I didn't get there. So who knows what's going to happen. And I'm sort of contemplating the unemployment thing, but I would rather the PPP, to be honest. Um, yeah. And I mean, I have like gone through the initial steps for the unemployment, but it's a nightmare. Like <laughs> in Texas, yeah. you can call like 50 times a day and all you get is a busy signal. So it's, you know. I think the PPP, hi, I'm, hey, I'm Jean. Nice to hi. meet you. <laughs> Um, I think PP, I think the unemployment is actually not uh, in it, it would never really they never started right the contractor side actually, of it. Do you know some Did people you? have gotten it? I mean, I'm an S corp, and I think that realistically Same, the yeah. is the best way for me to go. Yeah. Um, because then I can just pay my salary, and you know, but. But but there might be no PVP money, and I don't know. It's you know. At first, you I wasn't gonna apply for anything because I was like, well, you know, I have money in the bank, and I make money from stock, and maybe it'll be fine. And now, the longer this goes, I'm like, well, I shouldn't say no to money. So. But yeah. um, but what um, uh, do you have? Do you have employees? 
No. Okay. Thankfully, and, at this point. <laughs> and I did you? Passed. And did you apply through a regular connection that you have at, at a bank? I applied through the bank that I have my business account with. Yeah. And did you? And did you apply or er, apply early on, or did you? Did you wait? <laughs> so I applied. I think I started applying a uh, week before last, and then I had some issues because my bank realized that they had me misclassified as an LLC, and it was totally their fault. But they had to deal with a bunch of things to get me, you know, properly in their system as an S corp because it would have denied me. Um, so and anyway. did that delay? Do you think that delayed your your sure. application? Yeah, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. wow. Okay, that's like good. like like a day before yesterday was when everything finally got worked out, and um, and then the next, then you know, yesterday they announced there was no more money. So. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't understand though. The, so the money ran out, but do they? Did, did the money run out because they were accounted by the people who signed up before that, or they just? Uh, you there's know, plenty of people. From my understanding, is there's plenty of people who signed up who who did not get money at this point, um, and they just ran out of money because so many people signed up, and it just yeah. I've signed up about a week ago. And they, they followed up with me a couple of days after and just to check, to make sure I put in the right information. It was really kind of random call. Um, so um, it's really unclear what's happening with that. And, and you scary. haven't gotten any money yet? No, I only got, well, the only thing I got was that $1,000 from, you know, direct deposit from the, for, I, for the, what was it? Relief. The right. The, ten, the, 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 one, the one was supposed to be ten thousand that they were not clear about, but then well, I didn't get that. I didn't even get that. <laughs> that was a random. Yeah, I mean, but then again, it's a thousand. It's not ten thousand, so it's no, it's not. It's a thousand. You it's, know, uh, better than it's, nothing. But. <laughs> yes, different. Well, Inti, um, I'm so glad that you did arrive because because you you have so much experience with stock photography. Um, can I can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah, and actually, I mean, it's kind of nice that we're chatting about this anyway, because I, I did a Zoom talk um, two weeks ago that I just sort of invited people on Instagram and stuff to, to sign up and to talk about submitting to stock and things like that. So I can totally send that to you if you're interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, sure what you're doing is different, because obviously I was encouraging people to submit to agencies and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the summary view uh, of our conversation is that you know, Wonderful Machine has 550 photographers, um, and we also have an internal database of 25,000 other photographers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're pretty well known among photographers, among commercial photographers. And I think I'd like to think that we're pretty respected in in among photographers and among clients. Mm -hmm. And and I'm and I'm feeling like stock photography is at a weird <clears throat> point right now, um, especially with COVID. It's sort of um, uh, more and more relevant than, than, uh, than it has been, uh, in the yeah. past. Um, but even, even separate from COVID, um, you know, we've got a situation where Getty Images has dropped their rights managed photography and they're just doing, uh, royalty free and micro stock. Um, and, and I'm wondering whether, uh, number one, do you think that there's still, uh, a market, uh, for rights managed uh, stock photography. Uh, and if there is, uh, do you think that Wonderful Machine uh, could um, could play a positive role in in uh, in making stock photography viable for working photographers? I do think there's still uh, room for it. I think that the market is more limited than it ever was before. And that's why, you know, Getty, for example, let it go. But you know, you still have trunk archive and you still have gallery stock and they function more like um, a traditional rights managed model. Um, and I can also say that, you know, it, it is still possible with agencies to convert um, imagery to rights managed if a client wants it. So, and, and, I, and I know this because I've had it happen in the last year and I know some other photographers that have happened in the last year. And I think, I think what's changed is that previously, um, it, rights managed was, clients were really concerned about the history of licensing for that picture. And I think now the concern is less ab about that and more about 
in the future from when they license it for X amount of time, um, they want a certain level of exclusivity because I've had images that have been in a royalty free licensing model for a really long time all of a sudden be snapped up for a, a royal a rights managed license and then be taken out of the marketplace for a while, which is really interesting. Um, I would say the exception, exception to that and, and the obviously most lucrative avenue for any type of rights managed licensing is going to be pharma. Um, any type of medical and pharma, they still have the most money and they still want the most exclusivity. Now that, that doesn't mean that the content has to be medical imagery, right? But like approaching those clients um, and finding out what they're looking for and what they need right now. Um, and also, I mean, there is a potential, I think, for some photographers, even at this point, to, to shoot client work for them from their own homes, say they have cute kids or like whatever, you know? And so I think um, those avenues would be really worthwhile. Um, I know that you guys send out stock requests in Commune, I get stock requests from them as well. Um, I think what's frustrating, you know, from my side of the, the fence when it comes to uh, getting imagery together and submitting for those is that, frankly, sometimes those requests are, are too broad. And so I will spend hours upon hours putting a ton of imagery together and never even hear if the person who was looking for the imagery saw it, much less, you know, I mean, obviously they didn't choose it because they didn't get to me, but like, I think ways to to really streamline that so that there was less work on the photographer side um, in terms of getting the imagery to the people that they really actually would want so i don't know if it would be possible for example for them to sort of um, not just write a description about what they want but also show some images that that are in the vein of what they like um, i think that could be immensely helpful um, yeah uh, yeah we, we we do uh, we, it's funny you say that they're too broad. We, sometimes photographers are like, oh gosh, you're, you're so specific. Who's going to oh, have no, that? Oh no, but if they're specific, that's so helpful for me because yeah. then I'll just know oh, sure. immediately, nope, don't got it, or yes, I do. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> you can't please I mean, everybody. I get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, generally we're cognizant of those, those things about, you know, being specific and providing sample images. Um, so we do, we do attempt to do that. Um, uh, and what, do you have a sense of, of, of what, of, what, by the way, you know, I, I don't want to be too nosy, but what proportion of your income is comes from stock photography versus assignment photography? I mean, now stock these days, I make um, five to six thousand dollars a month, but that's a that's a small portion of my income. I used to make easy six figures, and it was like a big chunk of my income, and it's just dropped like precipitously. And, but to, truth be told. My collection's pretty old because because stock went down so much in terms of return on investment. I really haven't submitted that much in the last three years, so that's older imagery that's making me money, which is awesome. I'm not complaining. Right now, it's amazing <laughs> um, because I had a bunch of assignments and they all went away um, when this happened. So you know, hopefully they'll come back, but there's no guarantee. So so that's kind of why I did that Zoom talk a couple of weeks ago is because I really realized that. There were plenty of photographers who were in a much more precarious financial situation than I because they didn't have that stock income coming in. And it also was a little bit of a wake up call for me of like, man, I really should be feeding the stock beast like on a regular basis. And so what I've been doing over the past few weeks is going through shoots that I've done in the past three years that I didn't submit because I just didn't bother, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean like, I'm really grateful for it because obviously I'm not really sending any money that right now either. So like, I'm going to be fine even if I don't get these loans, you know, I mean, obviously it's far less income than I'm used to making, but I'm fine, you know? So yeah. Okay. And, and, and then my next question is what, uh, what percentage of your uh, stock photography business is, is rights managed sales versus uh, royalty free sales? Well, so because of the changes that Getty made, um, virtually they, they made sort of an executive decision and this trickled down to all the other agencies that I'm with as well, that anything that wasn't already licensed as a rights managed picture, even if it was in a rights managed collection, automatically got converted to royalty free. So I, I don't know, I have maybe 
less than 100 shots that are currently in rights managed because those were the images that still had license restrictions on them based on the older rights managed models. Some of, some of them had been sold for rights managed before, but those, those licenses had expired or whatever. So like virtually everything was converted to royalty free. And that was like, I had no control. It just happened. Right. And do you have any sense um, of whether, um, let's say hypothetically, uh, we got a thousand, I know there's only one in, into St. Clair, but let's say there's like a thousand photographers around the world who are sort of shooting um, pictures that have, uh, that are viable for, for rights managed stock. And, uh, and we could gather those photographers together and say, look, we're going to create a, a, a rights managed stock photography company. It's going to be owned by the photographers so that, so that it'll never get consolidated. It'll never get consolidated out of business. Um, and, and the, um, and all the profit, instead of the profit going to the, the, the investment bankers, the profit can go to the photographers. Um, is that, is that, is that something that would, um, solve the puzzle in a way, or, or do you think there, it would still, um, like, would that, would that be helpful to you? Is that something that you would want to see happen? So in theory, yes. In practicality, I'm not certain that it's a viable model. Um, and, and you are not the only person who has come to me asking about this and is thinking about doing this right now. There are others who ha are as well. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, based on my experience with blend images in particular, and like how everything sort of fell apart there, um, you know, it's just so, and, and maybe, maybe things are changing now because of you know, where we are in the world and, and, and how we're having to live right now and the feeling that that might have to continue for a while. And so really doing custom shoots for brands is going to be much harder. And so those brands that do have a lot of money that really want, you know, exclusivity on imagery these days, um, they, there may be a, a, an uprising in the, in the market for that, that we didn't have two or three months ago. Um, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, but there's some things that, that are really challenging, right? It's how do you get the images in front of the right people without spending a fortune um, on, on marketing and on, you know, driving traffic and like all those things. Um, and that's really challenging. And, and also, you know, um, Getty and others have done a phenomenal job of locking agencies into licensing exclusively from them when it comes to stock. So like I've had, you know, people that I've worked with at various ad, ad agencies for custom jobs, you know, come to me and say, hey, we know you have a ton of stock. Um, can you help us, you know, find this image for this client that they can't do a custom shoot? And I'll help them find the image. And, and they're very like, can we license it from you? Or where should we license it from that will get you the most money? And then they come back to me and they're like, oh, actually, we're so sorry. We have to license on Getty, Getty subscription or something. Like they're really, their hands are really tied from an agency standpoint. So like Omnicom, for example, like they don't let, they don't let you just license. They don't let you, meaning uh, our buyers or whatever, they don't let them just license from anywhere. So, so that's a real problem. Um, in, in other so, words, in other words, they're, they're, they're giving them such a good deal. They're mm -hmm. giving them a discount in exchange for you yep. only, only licensing through Getty. Yep. So yep. that's a sounds, deal. That it's sounds a real problem. That sounds illegal. That sounds I like mean, restraint it's, of trade. It's yeah. unfortunate. And, you know, maybe it's like, okay, they can do, you know, Shutterstock and Getty or something, right? I mean, so it's not, but like, I'll be like, hey, could you license this image from Stocksy directly or from Cabin directly or whomever? And they'll be like, yeah, no, sorry, we can't. Like, it's, it's really unfortunate. And it doesn't even, it's not about price. It's, it has nothing to do with price. It literally has to do with the agreements and the arrangements that they've made. And, and could they do it through you as an individual photographer? Does that make any difference? Sometimes, yes. And so that has been a thing where, um, you know, if I have the image already with Getty, then I am contractually obligated to, to tell the person to buy it from them. 
which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. So, so yes, I mean, sometimes they would be able to license directly from a photographer. I just, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I wonder from your side of things in terms of building it out and, and having the offering available and, you know, I mean, you know better what your traffic is and you know better what people are coming and looking for there. And like, perhaps it could be really great. I, I just, you know, I think there's a lot of photographers throughout time who have always wanted a rights managed model. And there are many photographers that I personally know who are multimillionaires in stock photography and fought royalty free for so long. And it put them out of business, like legitimately, like it put them out of business because they refused to get on board with what you know daddy and and shutterstock was doing and so it's it's a hard it's a hard one like i think you know we all would love to to find those clients who really value photography who want to spend the right to manage money and i it's just it's it's, it's hard to get it's hard and to what, be sustainable and would it and would it what caused blend to collapse um getting uh, frankly Put it, because Getty will put the squeeze on third party providers. And, you know, so at one point in time, and, and these are not exact numbers, so don't quote me on this ever. <laughs> but like at one point in time, you know, Getty was, if, an, if a blend image sold on Getty, they were giving um, blend 40%. And then it went down to 35 and then it went down to 25. And then, and then in the end, they were only offering 12%. And then, and then Blend had to share that with the photographer? Oh, no. Then we photographers got 50% of the 12%. So you got 6% on that sale. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. It literally just wasn't sustainable anymore. And, 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 and Getty, so Getty has done this sort of strong arm thing, not just with Blend, with plenty of other agencies, with individual contributors. They're still doing it. You know, now there's this whole trend of artist exclusivity. And so if you sign up, and agree to be artist exclusives and they give you a tiered, you know, a higher royalty percentage rate. And it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a beast of a market. It really is. And, and I mean, you know, Trunk Archive and Gallery Stock who are, they're the same parent company. They're just different collections. So Trunk Archive is a little bit more editorial and like celebrity and things like that. So the content is not necessarily model released in Trunk Archive, but being used for higher end editorial stuff as opposed to gallery stock where gallery stock, it's, it's all the content. It seems like any other stock agency, but it, they have a lot more exclusivity on it, but they, they want their artists to be a hundred percent artist exclusive. So for example, when gallery stock came to me and asked me if I would put their collection with them, they wanted me to pull all of my content from every agency that I was with and put it all with them. And I just couldn't imagine the work involved and how it would possibly be offset by sales through them at this point in time, given the current marketplace. There's just so much out there in stock, you know, I just couldn't imagine. And I mean, and so how does gallery, does gallery stock, uh, how does gallery stock work around the Getty exclusivity situation? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think they've, they've been around for a long time and because of their association with Trunk Archive, they have really great relationships with, with clients, you know, I, I'm really not sure. I mean, you know, when I've seen other agencies, whether that's like Kevin who, who jumped ship from Getty and tried to do their own thing for a long time and, and wouldn't allow their images to be on Getty, same with Stopsy, for example, you know, they, and they have ended up. Um, now they're exclusive with Adobe, for example. So it's like really hard for these small agencies to even compete. It's just, they can't, they can't do it. They try and, and, you know, Kevin and Stocksy both like really offer like much better royalty rates to their artists and, and they do okay for a while and then they just can't, they can't compete. Like it's really a struggle. Right. Okay. All right. Well then is there, is there any solution uh, that you can think of 
in general? Like, is there anything that you, is there anything that you, I mean, aside from um, sort of what we're already doing with just sort of our one, one off uh, stock requests, is there anything else that wonderful machine could be doing to capitalize on, on the relationships we have with photographers and clients? I mean, um, I think I would have to think about that a bit more, you know, I think, um, I mean, and, and one thing I can say is that I, I think that right now there is obviously increased motivation from photographers. So like if you were to say, hey, Wonderful Machine is going to have a stock site and we're going to have, you know, we're going to let you put up images and have them be available for stock and, and use our, our marketing collections and do all that. Like, I think that people would be really motivated to, to populate that with content right now, and they would be really excited about it. And as soon as we get back to work as assignment photographers, they're going to jump ship and you're not going to get new content. It's just how it is. I mean, they're just not going to make money, you know, like not the same kind of money that they could make in, in the assignment world. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe, I mean, look, I'm speaking for myself, right? Like I was someone who was so incredibly active. And, and then as you know, the numbers just started plummeting. And, and so I stopped submitting. I haven't really submitted to stock in three years because of just, I mean, even though I still make returns, like the, the content that gets you the most return, business, medical, stuff like that is incredibly expensive to self-produce. And, and then you, there's no guarantee that you're going to make that money back. I mean, you know, four years ago, I spent $30,000 on a medical shoot and, and I mean, I've made the money, the money back by now, but I would, I would really hesitate to do that again because it's just, there's so much imagery in the marketplace and there are photographers you know, in parts of the world who can produce that same level of content at a fraction of the cost that it would take me to produce. Right. Yeah, so. I had a conversation with a with a guy in Estonia uh, who is perfect is, example. Is Hell yeah, they are killing it. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, they can get models super cheap. They can get locations yeah. super cheap. Their cost of living is so much lower, and there are some houses, the stock production houses, that are raking in the money, but they're none of them are in America. They're all outside of America and they're doing phenomenally well because of the resources that they have. And we just don't have that here. You know, I mean, even like Sean Locke, for example, do you know who he is? Sean Locke? Yeah. So L -O -C -K. he is L-O-C-K-E. Um, he is in St. Louis, Missouri. And he is one of the few people that I know who is like 100% making his living off of stock still. Um, and he and I did a, he and I did a video thing for Adobe and he just did a, a talk with Adobe um, earlier this week. And, uh, you know, I mean, part of the reason that he can, he can make a living at doing it is because he lives in Missouri. <laughs> like, look, I used to live in Missouri. It's way cheaper to live there than other places, you know? And, and he also has a massive collection at this point. So, you know, yeah. And so, I mean, one of, one of our dilemmas is that, is that I, I'm trying to figure out whether, whether we're just chasing our tail doing stock requests at all. Mm -hmm. um, and because uh, it's actually pretty rare um, uh, that, we, that we actually fulfill a commercial yeah. stock request. I believe it. Um, and you know, like the stock requests come in and you see them, we send them out to you and we get stuff that comes in and, and you know, 90% of the time, nothing happens. And yeah. I think it's, I think it's just so easy for clients to say, Oh sure. I'll just send it out to those 500 photographers and see, you know, cause it doesn't cost them anything. Nope. So, so I'm wondering whether we should just start charging a hundred bucks for a stock request. Uh, mm -hmm. and then see, uh, and then see what clients do. Like if they really want to, uh, take advantage of our, our group of photographers, maybe they should be paying for that. Yeah. That, that's an interesting concept. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, look, I think if you're going to get into this space, whatever it is, you have to see, you have to do it in a way that's going to cost you the least amount of resources. And I mean, you're a smart enough business person to know that, but like, if you do decide to offer, you know, a stock section on your website, I mean, frankly, 
your best bet, as much as I hate to say this, is that, that the photographer should do all the work to put their pictures up and, and like look like, like when I was with Getty 15 years ago, I had a personal editor who I could call on the phone any day of the week and be like, hey, I'm thinking about shooting this. What do you think? And he'd be like, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't you do this and add this on blah, blah, blah. And what are you going to do the shoot? Can I come? And then like, Getty would pay for him to come on set. And he'd be like, yeah, this is great. Nope, we have that. Do that. And, and then I would literally like, I would be shooting film. I would develop the film. I would send him a contact sheet. He would circle the frames that I wanted and I would send the frames in and they would scan it, color correct it, you know, caption it, keyword it, like everything, right? Fast forward to now where that does not exist. None of that exists, you yeah. know? Like, but photographers don't want to do that work. No, they don't. But, they, but if you want to be in the stock space right now, you have to. Who else is going to do it? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's the reality. And that's true with any agency now that you're with. And that's one reason I also that I stopped submitting is because I was like, not only am I spending money that I don't know I'm going to get back in sales, but I'm also spending so much time beyond what I'm shooting, you know, getting, prepping the images, captioning, keywording, everything. It's just like, it, it, you know, so I mean, I guess I would say that, you know, if photographers already have imagery existing in their collection that is available and is great and they can put it up, that's amazing. And like they should, right? But in terms of really like motivating artists to create a bunch of new content, I just don't, I don't see that really happening. Like, you know, but you do have access and, and a collective of really top-notch photographers who I am certain have imagery in their collection that could be licensed for stock, right? But you, but how you're gonna present that to, to your network of potential clients in a way that's functional for them in terms of going on a site and looking for the image that, that fits the creative brief that they're trying to fulfill, that's a whole other question. And do you have any experience um, no, uh, with any um, off-the-shelf stock picture um, applications? Um, do you, do you know, uh, I, I know that there are companies that, I've talked to, to companies that make stock picture um, applications, um, but, uh, but you don't have any experience with them? I don't personally. Um, I mean... Yeah, I could probably refer you to some people who would. I mean, Stuart Cohen, have you chatted with him? Yep. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he, he bought out Superstock and he's, you know, got that going. And But I mean, look, Stuart and I are friends. We have been friends for 15 years. Like, we are buddies. And every time we hang out, he's like, when are you going to send me pictures? And I'm like, probably never, Stuart. And you know why? Because, like, I know the industry well enough to know that it's not worth my time to put my images there. Yeah. And is he doing rights managed or royalty free? I mean, for sure. Royalty free. Um, I doubt he's doing much rights managed, but I can't say for certain. And the reason I don't know, you know, super stock, they have all those historical archives. I'm not really sure. And which is, but so is, is he's, he now owns super stock. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's been very helpful. And, and, he, and his and his business partner is um, Rick Becker Lacron, who used to be the CEO of Glenn. What's his last name? Becker Lacron. Okay. And he was with Corbis. I mean, Beck, Rick has been in the stock industry for eons, like eons. Yeah. So, and I look, I respect both of those guys very much. Um, I really do. So, like. And do you, think they're, do you think they're making money? <laughs> I mean, they probably are. Are there photographers? Yeah, right. You know, and that's the thing, right? Um, I, I don't think, look, Stuart and Rick both are very savvy business people, and they do know the stock industry, like, inside out and upside down better than I do. No question. Like, hands down. Um you know, but for a really long time, it has been a winning proposition for people who own stock companies and a losing proposition for photographers. So,
So it's just the way it goes, you know? And even then it's still a challenge. I mean, you still, you still hear of, I mean, even blend folded, right? And like blend, blend for me, my blend was still going, even though I was with a lot of agencies, like that was the best agency for me to be with. Like it was the best. So. Do you have any experience with Stocksy? Because I was looking at that for, you know, I, I've signed up with them maybe when they started and then I kind of, I was busy. So I kind of decided not to pursue it. But then uh, I recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, I re-signed up and I was going to do like an application with them. But then this, you know, like one machine came up with sort of an idea too. Uh, do you have uh, any experience with them? I mean, I have very limited experience with them. Um, I have a contract with them. I, um, I haven't submitted that much. And again, that's that's also just because I kind of got the contract a few years ago and then I got so busy with assignment work that I just didn't, didn't bother. And I think that, um, uh, <laughs> I was, I was told to, to not, not submit aggressively with them right now. Mm. That's as much as I can say about that. Uh, I know some people in there and, and I mean, stock industry is hard. There were people who did extremely well there, but are not doing well anymore. Mm. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Was there, is there anything else uh, we should cover, either of you, before I go eat dinner? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we talked about it. This is so unexpected. How funny. But <laughs> um, and Auntie, okay. what's, uh, what's and what's uh, what's your quarantine situation like? You, I see you. You're you're you've got a couple dogs there. I have some puppies. Oh, and I didn't realize they were locked in here. That's funny. That's why they've been so anxious. I know. Um, mine, I, mine's mine's asleep right under at my feet. My, this is this is my baby right here. See, oh, wow. he's like eight months, and this one is my older one. Mm -hmm. Um, here's here's the Oh, cute. <laughs> Nice. So yeah, I have two, um, my two Australian shepherds and a cat, and then I have a fiance downstairs. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't with me the first month because he had to be in California because his mom got diagnosed with lung cancer, like right as all this hit. But she's doing well enough and, and passed her first surgery and now on chemo. So he came home um, on Friday, which was nice. Oh, that's, that's great. Week, so. That's great. But now I'm not alone. <laughs> Yay. Good, good. But I wish I had kids. Like, you know, I love to shoot kids so much, and I'm so jealous of my photographer friends who have kids right now. But on the other hand, they're like losing their minds because they're Jean, how, old is, how old is your kid now? She's uh <laughs> she's getting to close to five. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> so fast. Yeah. But yeah, it's great. Well, well, you should take the time to just photograph her doing like all the things, like everything. Yeah. I'm thinking there's there's a there's a um, a short uh, there's a, a little contest for uh, like a two minutes sh uh, short you know and I was thinking about doing a little short with her like a little movie yeah on the uh, it's iPhone it's like you know the in, in the house or backyard so I'm thinking like oh, I'll do something and then maybe maybe some maybe stock stock photos too maybe I don't know and truthfully I mean as far as stock goes right now for you shooting um shoot all the concepts that are like really obvious right like spending time at home with your family and cooking with your family and video chatting with your family and like all of that stuff shoot it and send it to adobe that's my advice they are editing stuff in two days right now your stuff will be mm. online in three days it's amazing they've approached so me uh maybe like a year ago somebody approached me but i you know i just it's just i just know it's such an undertaking to 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 you know, get uh, source releases and then and yes, but if it's your own family and you can shoot things yeah. that are currently relevant, like the time to market for them right now is amazing. Like Getty is taking um, over a month and Adobe is three days. Like holy mm. crap! Like just because because you know what what the hot topics are right now, and if you can shoot that right now, it'll it'll be selling. So like they, that's they seem. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, they seem to be they seem to have a pulse on, you know, on sort of trends really well. I, I watched a couple of different webinars uh, with so the their, former uh, well. VP of, of blend um, is now with them, Sarah Casillas, and I yeah. love yeah. her like I've known yeah. her for 15, 20 years and she she's really, on point. And Ian, the former, you know, head of Stocksy is there too. And they're working hard. So 
But Bill, I think with the, I think with your, you already have a commercial eyeballs on the company. I feel like you have already the connections to, to have something to, to start something, you know, it's just that, uh, it's just that I think it's just challenging up, uphill battle. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, to Inti's point, if we could have a relatively inexpensive, um, uh, computer application, you know, online application, uh, sort of off the shelf with a little bit of customization, yeah. you know, maybe it would cost us $50,000 to like build the website. Um, and then, uh, and then it could be mostly passive. We could just basically present it to our photographers and present it to the clients and, and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I mean, the business model I, I was su suggesting into, I forget whether I mentioned it to you was, was the idea if, if, if photographers, if we created a cooperative where photographers each uh, paid 20 bucks a month to be part of it, and then we would pay a 50%, a 50-50 split on the sales, and then every quarter we would also pay out a dividend. Instead of a dividend to shareholders or to investment bankers, we would pay a dividend to our subscribers. Hmm. Um, and then Wonderful Machine would collect a management fee to, to manage it. Mm -hmm. um, so... So I don't know. It, it's uh, it might be just pie in the sky. Um, but I wonder. Stock, like stocks need to co-op, and 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 they give their contributors a higher percent than anybody. And you know, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I I would say that I don't know. I know a little <laughs> about the the other side of things, the non photographer contributor side. But I I don't I don't know as much as other people. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we will continue to muddle through and and uh, and, and experiment with different um, 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 thinking on this, and, and I'll keep yeah. you posted. Okay. Nice All right. Well, Inti, you thank you for joining us. Yeah. Jean, <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining us. Great seeing you guys, and uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank take you. care. Have a nice weekend. All right. All right take care. Bye bye.